And welcome to another episode of Likeable Science, a special today. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on oddly a Tuesday afternoon rather than my usual Friday slot. With me today in the studio is Jay Fidel, uh, Think Tech Zone CEO. Welcome, Jay. Yes, sir. Glad you could join me today. I'm happy to be here. Well, that's great. And we're going we're gonna to talk about an interesting uh, asset or facet of science today. It, it's not actually necessarily so likable. Uh, the show title I had proposed was Courting Catastrophe, which gives you some, some sense it might, might not be exactly likable. But it was, it was driven by a, an editorial in, in a recent issue of Science that, that I saw, uh, written by Bruce Alperts, who was the former head of the National Academies and a uh, very distinguished scientist, pointing out that our educational system has fundamentally failed to teach the American public the, the, what science is all about and the value of science and the idea of science as a process. And, and he points out this is shown very clearly in, through our recent election cycle where basically people were told what they wanted to hear by people with no evidence or indeed mountains of evidence to the contrary, but they went right ahead and sort of followed this person who said what they wanted to hear. And despite the fact that you could sort of make very clean, clear, logical arguments against it, and this is a very normal human emotion, uh, human tendency to, to, to want to go with your cohort and, and sort of stay in, in sync and, and, and keep with the people who are thinking like you. But you would hope, and, and scientists hoped, I guess, and thought that people will listen to a rational argument and, and go with that an evidence-based argument, and it turns out not to be true. This leads to all kinds of problems, as you might imagine, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know my, my own track on it? When I was a, a kid in high school, we all loved science. Mm -hmm. Everybody's favorite course was biology mm -hmm. and um, math and physics. I mean, everybody loved that stuff. And a lot of them, a lot of them, a huge percentage of them went on to achieve in that area. They went to other schools in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, they became PhDs. They went in that direction. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I would say there were other places in the country that were going in that direction. Mm -hmm. And we haven't, been, we haven't been aware of that until now, about this polarization of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's what I would call it, yeah? There is some, there's a part of the country that is relatively well educated in this area or professional scientists in this mm -hmm. area. But as part of the country, never wanted to learn any of that. Mm -hmm. They weren't good in school, they weren't good in science. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of have a resentment about it. And that's the bubble they live in. And when, when Donald Trump comes around and says, why don't you guys dump on science? Mm -hmm. They're only too happy to do that because they're mad at science. Right. They haven't been treated well by science. They haven't done well. They haven't achieved anything. Right. And so I think we, 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 we didn't know this. We didn't see it until the Trump campaign. And now we see it clearly. Right. And it's very, very troubling for the future. Oh, ab absolutely. Now, this is, this is what, what uh, Alberts points out in, in his editorial is one of the things is science is not just another belief system. You know, science is actually a, an amazing human endeavor of a whole bunch of people getting together and agreeing on sort of a set of rules to try to figure out what makes the world work. How does the world, how does nature actually perform? What, what causes the phenomena that we see? Yeah. And that's very different from a faith-based system where you just, you all agree on, on some undefinable yeah. entity. Or I think you deity. struck on something really yeah. important. I mean, a lot of what a lot of the anti-science sentiment these days within Trump, um, they may not connect it up politically, but in fact, it's based on religion. It's based on faith. Right. And uh, faith is not science. Sorry, it's not science. And the Constitution, right. our, our founding fathers try to make a distinction right. between, call it the social science of government, mm -hmm. you know, and religion. Keep them separate. Right. Because you, you have to have evidence-based, you know, thinking. And if you don't have that, it's very hard to run a country uh, or an economy, or a scientific advance. Yeah. Exactly, and science is really one of the uh, sort of inarguable ways you can actually measure progress of humanity. I mean, there is no doubt sort of that due to science and technology, we are in a much different place today than we were 10 years ago, or 100 years ago, or 1,000 years ago. You can't so much make that argument for art, or literature, or politics, right? Uh, we're still doing the same, we're still doing sort of stupid government stuff the way we've always done it. <laughs> uh, you know, art, you know, art, can, you, can you really say that we're better than, you know, than Rembrandt or, or whoever you may choose? You know, I mean, it, has it really been progress? But in science and technology, you just look and see, of course, you know, we can move 
goods faster and further, we can communicate better. Mm. I mean, there's sort of a thousand different metrics that yeah. you, can, you can show real progress. Yeah, it's logarithmic, isn't right. it? In our lifetimes, it's been a joy to be alive yeah. and see this progress. Right. But sort of the downside is the consequences if you have policy making that's driven by ideology or religion or anything other than science, uh, this policy then, you know, it can fly in the face of fact, basically. Yeah. And I mean, you know, when you're striding down the sidewalk and your toe catches on a crack in the sidewalk and you're pitching forward, you may wish that the laws of physics didn't hold. You may wish that gravity was really <laughs> only a theory that wasn't going to catch up with you in the end. But an unseen hand <laughs> could come down from heaven and help you. Come on. <laughs> but no, you're, you're going to smack your face you know, flat on the sidewalk, yeah, and, and yeah. that's all there is to it. Um, yeah. Your wants have nothing to do with it. Your belief system has really nothing to do with it. It's, yeah. it's fundamental. You're going to be caught up in it. And that's what we're sort of now in a situation where, I mean, again, this whole business of adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and, and causing the greenhouse effect and, and making the earth warmer. People treat this like this is some kind of new fancy theory. This was back in the 1850s that the first scientists realized that, that CO2 was this key regulator of the atmosphere temperature and was a, was a powerful greenhouse gas. And it's been verified countless times since then, and no reputable scientist will, will argue against that. And well, this goes back to the dichotomy. I mean, there, there have been schools while you and I are growing up, Ethan, where they didn't study science, or sure. they studied it in a, in a faulty way. Mm -hmm. And as a result now, as adults, those people, those tens, hundreds of millions of people have no clue about this. Right. And so they're vulnerable to arguments that are specious. Right. And I think we have a lot of arguments. People would make arguments that are specious, not only you know playing on ignorance, but playing on the, their own self-interest to get people sure. to do things one way, to use their products, even though their products are faulty, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that people are vulnerable. Right. And I mean, you and I are not going to buy into that so quick, but there are hundreds of millions of people who are untrained. And the problem is that they form a large political constituency. Right. And you can't change them overnight. You and right. I could have this show, talk this talk for a hundred years. We're not going to affect a lot of people who have right. been trained the other way. Right. Um, so what does the country do? This is really yeah. a difficult problem to re-educate people who are ignorant. Yeah, well, this, this is what Albert sort of was the point of his, of his editorial was. We really need to go back and reshape the way we teach science and not worry so much about making science a collection of facts the way it has traditionally been taught, but help everyone, whether they're going to be a scientist or not, understand what science really is. That it's this way of thinking about the world. It, it is a way of making decisions based on clear, observable, inarguable evidence and, and really understanding that this is a very powerful way to, to, to deal with the world and you know, to make sense I, of the I world. I haven't thought about this before, but you make me think one thought, and that is this. You know, it is a philosophical thing. It is um, even a religious thing. On the one side, the faith, where you don't need science, you don't mm -hmm. want science, you rely on faith, mm -hmm. um, which is not evidence. On the other side is, is uh, you know, we want science to improve our lives. And we are looking for mm -hmm. evidence. We are trying to find the best that humanity, that the Homo sapiens species has ever learned. We're trying to apply that to our society. Mm -hmm. Those two are really different. They're different right. mm, philosophies. They're different ways of right. life, different ways of thinking. Very hard to bring that together. In order to make the person on this side of the equation agree with the person on that side of the equation, you have to dig it up from scratch. You have to say, wait, stop with this faith business. Let's talk about yeah. evidence. Let's talk about rationality. Let's talk about science. Right. It, it's not that they cannot coexist. People can't, but they are, I think of them as being sort of almost right angles to one another. They, they have almost nothing to do with one, <clears throat> each other. And it's possible to be a, a person of great faith and a great scientific believer too. But So I, you, right. you talk about uh, the kids in school, and he talks about the right. kids in school. Right. Very nice. But um, there's a lot of kids in school, right. and those kids in school are being controlled by people who are already over the, over the hill, if you right. will. Right. who are the adults who run the schools right. and the school boards and all that right. all over the country right. or at least in the red states anyway. Right. So how do you get the next generation of school of kids in school right. starting this Monday, right? <laughs> how do you get them straight on this? You have to change the schools and the teachers and the curriculum <coughs> and the syllabus and all that stuff. And you're not going to do that unless the people who run the schools right buy in, but the people mm -hmm. who run the schools are already ill-trained. Right. How are you going to do that? Do, do you remember Mark Twain's famous quote? First, God invented idiots. That was for practice. 
then he invented school boards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an impossible uh, task. And right. you know, this really makes you uh, sort of pessimistic about right. the future of it, because the country cannot survive without respecting science. I'm sorry. Uh, right. I mean, you're just not going to get very far, you know, arguing against things like gravity. You know, you, you can you can pretend that evolution doesn't happen, but again, evolution is going to march on and march on, sort of regardless of your belief. Yeah. You know, it, it's really, yeah. It, and the problem is that as we ignore science in our policies, we it's almost like trying to turn the clock backwards, which is a really bad thing, right? So uh, this March for Science, hey, uh, this weekend, Saturday. So talk about it. Yeah, a March for Science. It, it's a, a march that says you know, science should be a part of everyone's lives. Science should be a part of all of our policy decision. All of our key community decisions should be made with the best available science in mind, you know? And it, it, that's, that, it seems to me like a no-brainer, but um, th it's not being done, indeed. The recent uh, administrative administration's policies are, are cranking back and saying, ignore the science. You know, we don't care how much uh, CO2 you're pumping out. Uh, we don't care that you're releasing methane into the atmosphere, which is, is, you know, methane. Methane makes carbon dioxide look like a wimp gas. I mean, in terms of its power as a greenhouse gas, it's yeah, much more powerful. The environment, yeah. And there have been huge methane leaks recently. Uh, yeah. you know, they had to evacuate the whole, that whole area around uh, LAO, a whole yeah, neighborhood yeah. from a methane leak. Yeah. Uh, terrible. So, so, I mean, you know, this is problematic because, here's why. Because you have an administration, the Trump, the, the Donald Trump administration. I mean, uh, you showed me another article that was in the same magazine. Right. It's about all the things that he's doing to change the regulations right. that Obama put in place or that were in place before. Right. All the environmental regulations. Right. And his changes are all denying science. Right. Thank you very much. And so, little by little, we don't see it. It doesn't appear at the top 20 news articles in the New York right. Times. We don't see it, but you have to recognize that every day he's pulling the wings of science out of our government. Right. He's denying science in so many ways. He's rolling all these right. things back. And you know one thing I'd like to, can I tell you a story? Sure. Okay, Jack Balkin, who is the, mm, one of the leading, if not the leading constitutional law professors. He's at Yale, and he has a, a blog called Balkanization. It's very oh, interesting. Okay. And it's all about the, you know, the, the beat, the role, the evolution of, of constitutional law in this country. He was on our show. Uh -huh. And I asked him, you know, this is the time George Bush W. was president. I asked him, you know, Bush has done a lot of things to roll things back and to go the other way, faith-based, not science-based. Same issue. Mm -hmm. um, can't you know, can we recover when he's out of office? Uh, can we find a way back to where we were before? Mm -hmm. Does it snap back? Mm -hmm. uh, how does the Constitution work? Does it snap back to, for example, the Establishment Clause, mm -hmm. you know, with separation of church and state? He said, no, Jay. Everything is on its own effect in history. So George Bush had an effect in history. And when he was done, things had changed mm -hmm. on these very issues. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to go back right away. If they, if they could ever go back, it would be, it would be evolving back slowly, mm -hmm. maybe, hopefully, back. Okay? But it's much worse with Donald Trump. Yes. Because he is affirmatively rolling things back hundreds of years, right. maybe thousands of years, yeah. in terms of government and public thinking about science. And I think, you know, to get, you know, right now, as we speak, the wings are being pulled out on yeah. this issue, when we get to the end of his administration, and I surely hope it, it ends soon, um, then we're going to find out that you can't go back. It right. doesn't snap back. Right. You are in a different place, and the damage is done. Okay? Exactly. Exactly. Why don't we take a break and think about that very <laughs> incredible You must have been reading conclusion. my mind. I was just going to say the same thing. We're going to take a brief break. Uh, Jay Fidel is here with me, Ethan Allen, on a special edition of Likeable Science. We'll be right back. Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pauline Shakmakjian. I'm the host for a new show on Think Tech Hawaii called Outside In. Outside In will be taking a look at how the external world can help shape Hawaii's future. And I will be starting the show hopefully next year in terms of regularly scheduled programming. And we hope to invite a wide variety of different guests ranging from history, philosophy, art and architectural fields, all the way to robotics, biotech, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and the like. So we're going to have a full range of guests 
to cover many different areas of interest. And I hope to see you next year. Until then, aloha. My name is Mark Shklov, and I'm the host of Law Across the Sea. And Law Across the Sea is a program that brings attorneys who have traveled across the sea and live in Hawaii or are staying in Hawaii for a time to talk about their travels, where they're from, where they're going, and bring it all together because really we're all connected some way, although we travel across the sea. So I hope that you'll tune in and watch our program. Thank you very much. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Uh, Jay Fidel is with me today on a special edition of Likeable Science, and, and we're talking about the, uh, the calamities, the catastrophes that, that, that we court by uh, ignoring science at our own risk. Well, you, but you mentioned during the break that on climate change anyway, mm -hmm. and there's other things too, but um, there's, a, there's a momentum effect. In other words, even if you corrected what Donald Trump has done right now today on a given Tuesday, mm -hmm. um, we, we would have continuing bad effect for years and decades and years sure. uh, on climate change. Sure. And we can't stop it. And so it, what he's doing is making it much worse, much worse. Right. I mean, it's like, it's like if, if you have a smokestack bel belching out smoke, yes, you can turn, turn off your furnace and stop that smoke, but the rest of the smoke continues to drift around the, the earth time and time and time and time again, affecting everyone's lives. They're all breathing this in, getting lung trouble, and it turns out probably also getting dementia from it. Uh, which is <laughs> there's, whole, there's evidence for that. Yeah, yeah, there's a yeah. whole special thing uh, right but now. What's, what's interesting, though, is that, uh, you know, I talk about faith-based, and you, well, we both mm -hmm. do, and um, talk about the trying to divide rationality from mm -hmm. faith and all. But it's not just, it's not just faith mm -hmm. that's the problem here. It's self-interest, mm -hmm. interest of multinational corporations, of large corporations, sure. which are dedicated to a given product or project that is detrimental to us right. and that is in violation of good science. Right. Um, and uh, uh, they'll keep on doing it as long as they can. They'll, for, for one thing, they'll try to confuse the public. Right. For another thing, they'll try to affect the government. Yeah. And yeah. if the government buys into it, then we're all affected. We're all in this morass of yeah. misinformation. Sure. That's, that's I, what's happening. I mean, you, you look back at, at the, the tobacco companies for years managed to keep cigarettes up and being marketed, even though it was, there was an overwhelming evidence that these things are, are dangerous, that they're costing the, the, you can still the, buy a all pack of us. cigarettes is poison, right? but you can still buy a pack but, of but cigarettes. But now at least they're being taxed at a pretty hefty rate and, and presumably, you know, uh, well, fewer people smoke for yes, sure. Yes, uh, yeah. it has cut down on the smoking and uh, the non-smokers are not quite left with such a heavy tax burden for caring for the, the health problems but of the smokers. There's so many examples right. though of products and processes Sure. of businesses that shouldn't be doing business. Sure. I, I, I mean, mean, how could he support the coal business when everyone knows how, how uh, detrimental that is to the society? Right, right. The, the way they mine coal now by knocking off the tops of mountains is just, it's appalling. I mean, yeah. it, it, it has huge downstream effects when they push all the rubble down into the streams, you yeah. know, as it were, and bury the streams. But it's, it's because, I think, at least in part, that's not religion. Right. That's not faith. Right. No, that's money. That's money. Yeah. That's money for, the, for his campaign. And he's, what did I, I read? He's got, uh, oh, gee whiz, $20, 30000000 million already easy. Right. Uh, only 10 weeks after he was uh, inaugurated for his next campaign. Oh, my God. So, <clears throat> you know, the problem, problem with that is, uh, is uh, what Citizens United, mm -hmm. the problem with that is a, a breach in the Constitution, if you will, to mm -hmm. allow... Citizens United to be the law. The Supreme Court failed us badly on that. Yes. There's no excuses for it. Every every judge who voted for that or permitted it to happen is, should be held accountable for that. Right. That was such a bad move. Right. And it is affecting things. It is making people like Trump possible. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what we have is special interest groups, capital concentrations, mm -hmm. doing things that are, that are damaging to the public and to us individually right. and to our world and our society, our environment, right. Right. Uh, with impunity because the government lets them do that, right. um, even when everybody knows it's the wrong thing. Yeah. It's, it's ruled by special interests. Yes, and it, it, it's, a, it's an appalling thing, right? There, there's, not, there's not this recognition that we all have to step back, take sort of deep breath, say, hey, we're all in the same same." big blue marble together, right? We need to, we're all breathing the same air, we're all drinking the same water. These things just go around and around and around. They go into my lungs, they, they go into your lungs. And so, you know, if, I'm, if I foul up some air, you know, you're gonna end up, you know, pay, paying the consequences for it. You know? So what, I guess what this suggests to me is that this is more than just teaching the kids in school. 
And it's more than just te it's more than teaching the kids in school and teaching the school boards. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's more than healing, you know, this huge polarity mm -hmm. between science and something other than science. Mm -hmm. Because um, I think that's very hard anyway. Right. It's, it's, it's a legal problem we have. It's a constitutional problem. It's Citizens United. Mm -hmm. It's super PACs. Mm -hmm. And it's allowing these large multinationals which, with unlimited resources mm -hmm. to affect public opinion and tell untruths to the public sure. and cause public opinion to go the wrong way and government to go the wrong way. Sure. It's a recipe for disaster. Right. We are on the wrong path. Absolutely. I mean, I thought Stephen Colbert did a great job uh, setting up his own super PAC and just pointing out that the sort of absurdity of, of setting up how sort of easy it was to set up how the rules that guide and, and regulate super PACs are so sort of easy to flout. Uh, that, that he could basically could have started pulling in huge amounts of money to this if he had wanted to, to, to do whatever he wanted to do with that. Yeah. So if we began today, and if Congress were all rational today, mm -hmm. they would fix this. Right. But there's no chance they're going to knock off Citizens United, or the Supreme Court is not going to is right. going to knock it off. Um, there's there's no uh, possibility that um, you know that, that we'll stop super PACs right now right. soon, and so this is all going to continue, and that and that shows like a fur a further problem. Nobody out there seems to be interested in fixing it. Right. So how can we even approach a fix when nobody wants to fix anything? They're all interested in their self-interest. Right. right. Well, that's what the, what this march of science coming up uh, this weekend is all about. Yeah. You know, it, it is saying no. Let's let's stop and let's let's demand from our leaders that they make rational, evidence-based policy decisions that are in the in the good of the people, not just in the good of a few people who paid a lot of money. Uh, well, that leads me to suggest to you, Ethan, that the march, the march for science is much more than a march for science. Exactly. It's, it's a march for other things. It's a march too. for sanity. <laughs> <laughs> That's where somebody needs to carry a, a sign that says march for sanity. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, the, it's, it plays out in so many different ways. Uh, the, the young woman carrying this, this sign for in a, in a pre-march, it says, remember polio. I don't. You know, pointing out that she was, as a young person, has never has lived in a world that basically is free of polio. Well, in two small countries, which they won't let us get into, and when our doctors finished the vaccination, that will wipe polio off the face of the planet. Uh, you know, it's not a sort of it's not rocket science in many cases. It's just simple. Okay, we now know this. Here's a way to deal with it. Let's do it. Yeah. And, and instead, it's easy choice. Right. And yet there, are, right. there's a large number of people sure. in this country, and I say. In this country, I think it's a special American phenomenon yep. um, that don't want to do vaccinations for their children, even right. though that puts their child at risk and the kid next door at risk yep. and the whole society at risk. Yep. And they got some cockamamie reason for right. that. There's no good reason for that. Science tells us clearly. They have seen now in the first three months of 2017 in, in England now, they've seen more uh, measles cases, I believe, in, in their because public schools than they did in the entire last year in 2016, they're now in the first three months of 2017, because yes, they, they've gotten down because of this belief that uh, somehow vaccines are, are bad, oh, that they oh, cause autism tragic. or whatever. So it's actually getting worse. Yeah, yeah, they, they've dropped the vaccination rate down to a point where essentially measles can get going again now, uh, which it was basically stopped before. You, you, know, you need to keep your vaccination rate at about 90 to 95%, and they're down to about 85%, and they're starting to see these diseases pop back How up. quickly we forget yeah. the, uh, the, yeah. the disasters of previous diseases yeah. that we thought we had, had uh, yeah. you know, excluded. So, <clears throat> you know, we got, we got, and then we got on top of that, we got a world in which everybody moves around, mm -hmm. and Hawaii could be victim to this any day of the week. Right. A world where there are vectors and viruses coming from hither and yon mm -hmm. that could go into, uh, you know, pandemic yep. any day of the week. Yep. This, is, this is so obvious, and you can read so much right. about it. And yet we are, we are exposing ourselves increasingly to the possibility of a, of a, a pandemic that will kill millions, hundreds of millions of people in mm -hmm. this world. Yeah. Why do we not apply science to this? Yeah. Why do we not take steps to protect ourselves? Okay. Why do we have our heads in the sand? Do you know why? Well, there, there actually are lots and lots and lots of good people working very, very hard to, to try to stop this. But yes, there, there's much more that could be done and needs to be done. Uh, there, there are diseases that are e evolving very rapidly. Yes, if we would study, for instance, just the influenza virus a little more and could figure out 
how is it that it keeps mutating and changing? This is evolution, though. So now is know. the time to do that. But yeah. he's pulling money out right. of NIH. Right. He's pulling money out of uh, medical research. Sure. He's pulling. We're we're yeah. we're going static or backward. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we will pay a hideous price, oh. honestly. Right. Right. Uh, the, the environmental regulations are uh, cutting the EPA by 30 percent. Is what's this propo proposal, or more than 30 percent? That, that's. You know, you're, you're just asking for trouble. You're asking for increased pollution that's going to be much more expensive to clean up later. You're asking for exacerbation of problems that are going to be harder to stop because they have momentum. Uh, the, the classic example being the ocean. Even if you could cut, stabilize air temperature today, the ocean is going to continue to warm for yeah. about 50 more years. Yeah. You know, the, these things aren't going to go away. They can't be just yanked back the way you, you were suggesting that they have momentum and uh, unfortunately yeah we're, we're, we seem to be right now rolling increasingly fast down down the wrong hill as it were or in the yeah. wrong direction you sound pessimistic but I, I want to tell you we did a show yesterday with a few scientists we did mm -hmm. two shows yesterday with mm -hmm. a, with a half a dozen scientists and at the end invariably um, to close they said um, but we're optimistic yeah it was hard to find a, 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 what do you call it evidence-based optimism there <laughs> Well, science has solved very, very, very serious problems in the world, um, and it, it's taken us, it's lift, you know, lifted us up by our bootstraps, as it were, out of the dark ages and into our, in this present rather astounding world that we have. And just as you said, within our lifetimes, we, we've seen advances that were, were just inconceivable. So uh, we, we do have reason to be optimistic, and I, and I am actually optimistic. So tell, tell me why. Tell me your analysis on that. Well, because I do think there are actually a lot of good-hearted, smart people in the world working very hard to, to make the world a better place, and I think fortunately without, lot, without grants, without money, yeah, well, without support from the government, <coughs> that's kind of, without support from the community. <laughs> yeah. That's why this march is so important, yeah, because yeah. in the end, I hope, it's the community that determines these questions. Exactly. So, and so, there are 500, uh, what do you call it, uh, sympathetic marches right. around the country and the world right. on, on Saturday right. to make the same point. Yeah, yeah. Again, science is not separate from society. Science lives in a culture, is supported by a culture, and must support the culture in, in and of itself. And, and you can't, you can't extricate the two. They're, they, it's impossible. And, and the flip side is, if you take science away right. from our society we're, with we're, our seven we're, billion we're, people, it will collapse. Yep. yep we're, we're, and billions of people will yep, die. Yep. And that could include everybody we yep. know. Yep. Yeah. And on that cheering note, <laughs> we'll end another episode of Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Jay Fidel has been uh, the, the shining light of optimism here. <laughs> Happy to be with you, Ethan. <laughs> uh, aloha, Jay. Until next week. Aloha.